Okay, part two of this module is uh, gene fusions. Uh, so this is sort of looking at the how the rearrangements affect the transcriptome. Uh, the definition of a gene fusion is just a novel gene formed by the fusion of two distinct uh, wild-type genes. So from a translocation or some other type of rearrangement event, we have two normally uh, distinct genes that are brought together, and we have the formation of a gene that is a combination of the two. Um, these we, we know are very relevant in uh, clinical features of some cancers. Um, I think the best example here is the BCR-ABL1 uh, fusion, one of the first uh, somatic events to be discovered. Uh, it, originally, we, we discovered it in the genome using cytogenetics uh, when we when we, the Philadelphia chromosome, uh, the translocation that creates this gene fusion was discovered. Uh, and now it's kind of uh, this held up as this uh, as this example of how targeted therapies can work because we've created uh, a small molecule that inhibits the BCR ABL1 uh, gene fusion product, and uh, that, that drug is called aminotib, and it's very effective for uh, treating uh, CML patients. Another aspect of these gene fusions is they can be used as uh, prognostic markers, usually by uh, looking at uh, fish results, uh, Similar, similar cytogenetic results, so uh, pathologists will look at these results to try and identify uh, whether or not a patient is, uh, has a cancer that's driven by one of these gene fusions. Uh, and then recent excitement uh, has recent developments in <coughs> RNA sequencing and genome sequencing have developed a lot of excitement of finding more of these events. So further evidence that Gene fusions are uh, clinically relevant. They're initiators of uh, carcinogenesis, and we see that because they correlate with the cancer phenotype. Uh, if we treat a patient uh, which harbors one of these gene fusions in their tumor, uh, then we, if we success successfully treat them, then that eradicates any products that are associated with gene fusion. Um, gene fusions produce neoplastic or disorders when uh, they're in, uh, when they're put into mouse models, and silencing fusion transcripts will um, reverse the tumorigenic process. There's several different classes of gene fusion. Uh, the first shown here is uh, deregulation of a proto-oncogene. So we have a translocation that brings together uh, the promoter region of one gene and um, the functional domains of another gene. And that means that now the, uh, this new fusion gene, the expression of that fusion gene is uh, driven by a promoter that is perhaps upregulated, uh, as in this example where IGH uh, now drives uh, overexpression of MYC in uh, Burkitt's lymphoma. We can have other forms of deregulation, such as a microRNA uh, binding site that is swapped between two genes, uh, making uh, it difficult for the cell to use uh, translational repression uh, through this microRNA binding site uh, to inhibit the expression of, or a translation of a particular uh, transcript. And that leads to an overabundance of the, the protein products of a particular uh, gene. So it's not only the case that a gene fusion will just result in overexpression of the functional domains of the uh, three prime gene. You can also have, in the BCR ABL1 example, uh, functional domains from both genes uh, forming a, a new gene fusion with uh, sort of a novel function within the cell. Another example of the a class of gene fusions is just a disruption of a tumor suppressor gene. So in this case, really the fusion product, the transcript that we're seeing that is a, a fusion transcript, is evidence that there's uh, somehow uh, the wild-type genes are being disrupted 
um, and uh, this is just through the translocation that is in interrupting the uh, or translocating uh, the gene so it's, it's no, no, no longer functional. And then of course, uh, this was published recently, as an example where we have multiple mechanisms caused by just one reciprocal uh, rearrangement, uh, or actually inversion in this case. So there's an inversion. An inversion, if, if you remember from the previous uh, part of the module, an inversion will create two breakpoints. So in that way, it can create two gene fusions. And for this particular example, it creates uh, two gene fusions, one of which uh, the result of that gene fusion is silencing of, of the tumor suppressor, and the, the result of the other gene fusion is this uh, new uh, fusion uh, transcript that has some, has some um, oncogenic function. In terms of uh, discovering gene fusions, uh, we've seen a massive increase in the number of gene fusions that have been discovered since the advent of RNA sequencing. Uh, this seems to be the platform that is used most commonly to identify these events. I think genome sequencing is also possible, uh, but uh, for reasons I'll show you um, in, the in a subsequent slide, it's not always apparent what the gene fusion is that relates to a breakpoint you find in whole genome sequencing. RNA-seq, I think you will um, cover this also in, in the expression module, but I'll just briefly detail the steps here. It's pretty much the same as whole genome sequencing, but we have this added step where we have to take our um, mRNA, mRNA that we pull down using uh, using uh, sort of a poly A pull down, and then we reverse transcribe uh, the mRNA into cDNA, and then we just follow the regular sequencing protocol on that cDNA, which involves fragmenting, size selecting, and then uh, paired in read sequencing. Okay, so. <coughs> Uh, what happens w in the steps from a translocation that creates a gene fusion all the way to uh, what we see, which is the uh, discordant reads? Well, uh, we have an additional uh, issue to deal with in RNA sequencing um, when we're looking for gene fusions <coughs> in that we'll have a chromosomal rearrangement, say a, a uh, reciprocal trans or a translocation that brings together uh, gene X and gene Y on chromosome A and B, uh, then the uh, transcript that is produced from this fusion gene uh, splices out the, uh, the introns. Uh, usually, uh, for most of the uh, gene fusions that uh, have some kind of relevant, relevant biological function, the breakpoint occurs in the middle of one of the introns. That's just more likely to happen because introns are larger. And so the breakpoint itself gets spliced out and we end up with this fusion transcript, which is partly, uh, partly the exons from gene X and partly the exons from gene Y. Then the sequencing is applied to, RNA sequencing is applied to this fusion transcript and we get, uh, similar to whole genome sequencing, we get uh, wild type reads, so concordant reads, and then we get uh, what I will call split reads and spanning reads, or but these are equivalently called discordant reads or um, split reads. Um, again, we have two choices similar to in whole genome sequencing. Uh, we can do uh, an alignment-based approach um, in our analysis of RNA sequencing or an assembly. Uh, assembly of RNA sequencing, because the sort of space of possible sequences is smaller, it's actually quite a bit more tractable to do an assembly of an RNA seq data set than it is for a whole genome sequencing data set. So, this is definitely a, an approach that is used in the field is to do a ass full assembly of the transcriptome and then uh, map those transcripts that we've assembled back to the genome and identify ones that are involving the exons of one gene and another gene for as, as possible fusions. Um, but I think it's probably still more common to use an alignment-based approach where we take the reads, try to align them back to the, the, uh, the genome and the transcriptome, uh, 
and uh, then assemble transcripts by looking at uh, clusters of, al of aligned reads that support the same fusion event. So, th but there is this problem of, uh, given that our RNA-seq reads are, uh, given that they undergo this, there's a, this process that the, that the sequences undergo to get to the uh, place where we're observing these read sequences of, uh, of splicing. So uh, it's no longer the case that we're just looking at reads that come directly from the genome. There's this extra process of splicing that uh, complicates things. So the question is, what uh, reference do we use? Um, we can either align to the genome in which case we have to deal with split reads that are not only caused by a fusion, as you can see on the, uh, the left side of this paired end read in the middle here, uh, but we also have to deal with the problem of aligning reads that cross uh, a splicing boundary that sort of span an intron. Uh, to get around this problem, we can, uh, we can align also to transcripts so cDNA sequences of known genes with known splicing patterns. And this will, this helps to recover a lot of the um, alignments that normally would be difficult. And this slide just is uh, some evidence that the best, the optimal way of doing this is to align to both the genome and the transcriptome. I'll uh, just quickly skip through that. So false positives in gene fusion prediction come from, uh, similar to whole genome sequencing, they come from alignment artifacts, uh, especially uh, homologous genes. And I think the problem that's uh, unique to RNA-seq is we have very high expression <coughs> of uh, parts of the transcriptome, especially ribosomal RNA. I think ribosomal RNA is, is generally tried to, they, people try to filter that. Uh, with, in the molecular biology steps, but uh, still some of that gets through, and we have because they're so highly expressed, they're just more prone to producing reads that um, er erroneously map and perhaps suggest a gene fusion. So, I think one of the computational steps is identifying the sources of these highly expressed uh, <coughs> regions of the transcriptome, like the ribosomal RNA, and then just removing those. Um, there's also a few. Very, uh, there's a there's a, there's a couple artifacts uh, or processes that generate artifacts that will generate this sort of its low level sequencing noise. Uh, reverse transcriptase and template switching is one of them, and then there's also ligation artifacts. These are generally just producing small, very small numbers of uncorrelated um, chimeric reads, and they can usually be filtered. Uh, the predictions that come from those can be usually filtered out pretty easily by just looking at uh, only at predictions that have a reasonable number of supporting reads. Um, another source of artifacts is uh, sources of natural rearrangement in the, in the transcriptome, such as uh, Ig rearrangements. If we end up sequencing a lot of uh, immune cells, then sometimes what we can end up with in our RNA sequencing is a lot of Ig rearrangements that are then producing uh, expressed, expressed transcripts. And then those will end up looking like um, fusions. And so we can just filter those out by looking at specifically the biology that uh, could lead to the particular artifacts. And uh, one of the other interesting ones is, that's quite prevalent is uh, something called a transcription-induced chimera, or a read-through. This is just where, um, so in a, in a tumor genome, you have various reasons, such as open chromatin, that uh, transcription is more active across the genome. And very frequently, you have genes that are adjacent that are co-transcribed um, just because the uh, various mechanisms in the cancer cell are, are disrupted that would prevent this from happening, and maybe you get more frequent skipping of a, um, a transcription stop site. And so you get a lot of uh, the events that you will predict when you're using a gene fusion tool are just adjacent genes that are co-transcribed. 
and these are called read throughs, and they're quite common in both tumor and normal samples um, and benign samples. So to reduce these artifacts, uh, techniques that are used for alignment artifacts are just to calculate features of the alignments that are supporting a gene fusion and use hard filtering or uh, some machine learning to classify these as true or false. Uh, for natural sources of rearrangement, it's just important to find the relevant database, such as uh, gene lists of IG genes, and annotate, and then and filter those. And transcription-induced chimeras or read-throughs, these can be easily identified as just involving adjacent genes. Um, now, to prioritize gene fusion, lists of gene fusions, I think, oh, go ahead. If so, if something is only happening in like one read, for example, like yeah. how would you, would you say like, oh, something is 50x, and then you drop everything under that has less than like two reads, or right? Right. Um, there's not really a coverage in RNA-seq because uh, it's so dependent on expression. So right. Um, right. there's other measures like um, reads per kilobat or map to kilobase, RPKN. Uh, but then, okay, so the question is for more for fusions, like what is an appropriate threshold for the number yeah. of reads you would expect? Um, it's I think that like you're trying to get rid of, like separate artifacts from something that's actual biology, right? So if something is just subclonal. Yeah. It may only show up in one read and then you don't actually know. Yeah. I mean, and it could have low expression but still somehow be relevant, or maybe it was historically relevant in that, yeah. um, in that tumor. Um, I think, I mean, I could give you a, sort of a ballpark number yeah. between five and ten reads, at least, that you should have. Okay. Uh, that would remove, then, those those types of artifacts that are uh, the ligation artifacts and reverse transcriptase template switching. But, like something that's real. Yep, that's true. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just a question. Sure. Yeah. All right. Um, to to prioritize gene fusions, uh, generally look at uh, expression of the, of the exons that are brought together uh, by the predicted gene fusion. Look at the, if those are highly expressed. If the expression is interrupted, if we look at the expression across the wild type gene, that would imply that the wild type gene is, is less um, expressed compared to uh, the fusion. Um, we can look at recurrence across multiple samples. Um, recurrence can be looked at in terms of uh, the pair of genes, and then also it's possible that uh, one of those genes involved in uh, the fused pair of genes is frequently uh, fused to other genes, and that uh, can be an indicator that that's a relevant fusion in, in the samples that we're looking at. And then, of course, we can look at any corroborating rearrangements that we identify in the, in the genome if we have matched whole genome sequencing. Um, we can look at uh, gene function set, such as whether or not from, say, uh, cosmic, the, the gene is implicated in cancer. Um, kinases are frequently involved uh, in gene fusions, uh, and they're the ones that usually are in the three prime position. And uh, also, of course, if it, uh, one of them is already a drug target. Um, so. Another way of prioritizing these is to try and understand whether or not the, the fusion uh, gene product, so the protein, would actually be, uh, tra the, the, the transcript would be translated into fusion uh, protein that has some relevant uh, function. And the, the way in which this uh, is assessed is by looking at uh, whether or not the, the uh, codons of the three prime uh, gene are, uh, would be successful to be translated. So what happens is a breakpoint usually occurs in the, in the intron of the fusion gene. Uh, and then at the junction uh, between the exons of those two genes, if we have a frame shift, then all of the downstream uh, 
codons will be nonsense. And so this is something to look for, that whether or not the breakpoint and the fusion boundary preserves the reading frame of both genes. Uh, I'm just going to grab some more water. All right, so it's it's somewhat interesting to look at analyze the gene fusion partners. Um, so if you're looking at a novel gene fusion to analyze uh, what the par partner's general function is and then look at uh, the fusion, gene fusions that we've discovered so far in the literature, uh, how your uh, maybe gene fusion that you're assessing for its function relates to those uh, known fused partners. And tyrosine kinases are, are frequently involved in fusions, um, again, usually at the, the, the three prime of the, of the partner because it's upregulation of some uh, tyrosine kinase to change the uh, change how the uh, signals and are um, propagated through the cell and how uh, perhaps the regulation of, of different parts of cell processes are disrupted. Transcription factors again are uh, also frequently involved in gene fusions and then oncogenes are frequently upregulated by something called a promoter exchange. So about uh, maybe eight years ago, uh, Felix Middleman looked at all of the gene fusions that had been uh, discovered so far with cytogenetic methods, and then built uh, gene fusion, a network out of these uh, gene fusion partners, where he took all of the genes and then just uh, drew edges between those genes if they were fused in some sample. And uh, from this analysis, they, they ended up with three larger clusters. Uh, and within those clusters, it was mostly, predominantly there was uh, isolated uh, or singleton genes that were connected just to one other gene. And then there was a smaller number of genes that were very promiscuous, so they would fuse to uh, multiple uh, partners in multiple different samples. And so there's the uh, possible reasons for this are that they were using targeted approaches. And so that would sort of, uh, there's, say, if you have for the MLL gene, you have uh, race assays or fish assay, fish probes, there where for which you're looking for everything that's connected to that particular gene that's going to bias you to, to looking at. Uh, only identifying partners of MLL. Um, and so that was one theory for why it was so connected in, in that way. Um, now that we have uh, discovered many, many more gene fusions, we find that the fusion network, especially in uh, cancers such as ovarian cancer, is much more sort of uh, diffuse and less connected. It's more uh, the case that we have just isolated pairs of gene fusions. And then, of course, the question is what uh, function, if any, do these have? I think this, so the, 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 the main uh, result of this, these recent gene fusions, sort of pan-cancer pan gene fusion studies, is that we have many more predictions. Uh, but now we realize that there's, these events are frequent, and we have to do um, there, we need a lot more work to understand which of them are just passengers of genome instability. So would it be the same sort of ratio as we would see for, let's say, white mutations of very small fraction of the drivers versus uh, most of the passengers? Um, I think it would probably be a higher ratio than that because uh, the fusions that we're, we're talking about are, uh, there's a number of things that have to happen before it, they're classified as a, as a fusion. So it has to have a breakpoint. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more restricted than just, say, all of the breakpoints that involve genes, because then they have to bring back the proteins together in a way that uh, makes it so that it's not, the downstream protein is not nonsense, et cetera, et cetera. So, but it's still, a large fraction of them have got to be passengers. <clears throat> 
that's so the question is whether or not there's background a background level of germline gene fusions. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, certainly, there are uh, read throughs. I'm not sure I would classify those as gene fusions, but read throughs do happen in um, normal samples. Uh, and there must be gene fusions that happen very rarely in. There's, like there's definitely in the pathologic no malignancy, there's inherited germline fusions. Okay. But to find them is really difficult because obviously we can't take a blood sample and look for a germline, right? So, um, so live primaries is what we're doing in the So you. You're saying that you can't just uh, sequence the, the blood and then compare it to the reference well, of the like a healthy person. Only, if you talk See. about hereditary hematological malignancies, yeah. so classic example is leukemia. If you take a blood sample from the leukemia patient, you don't have normal in there, right? Right. There. Yeah. So then you have to find another tissue. So um, it's very hard to find the kind of normal. Um, sets of the skin as a standard hmm. and there's a lot of discussion because we're trying to set it up locally and microarray is a standard but one of the things i wondered was whether you could use something like v9 or another third generation long sequence something that does long sequence reads that would potentially pick those up depending on the size Sorry, I, I missed that. Yeah. Yeah. So microwaves, they won't give you the sequence level, but uh, so if you think about so TMPRS is two erg uh, found in in prostate cancer that that was actually picked up by expression arrays. Uh, using a, an analysis of just outlier express, expression. Um, and then, of course, they went and validated the sequence, but you can still, st yeah, I guess you would, n nowadays, though, you would just use RNA sequencing because you get expression and then you get nucleotide level information. <coughs> okay, so more on these landscape papers. Um, this figure is just showing how uh, genome instability is related to the number of, uh, of gene fusions that are found uh, in a particular uh, cancers. So in the middle plot, we're showing some measurement of genome instability that's rising as we go from left to right. And then we see at the top the proportion of samples uh, for which we find gene fusions is, is rising also. In the uh, bottom figure here, uh, this is drawing a distinct distinction between balanced and unbalanced uh, rearrangement events that produce gene fusions. Uh, if you look at, in general, at the one at the gene fusions that have been discovered that are known to have some functional impact, then more frequently those are created by balanced rearrangement events. And this seems to be that, so for for unbalanced rearrangement events, the effect is. Uh, predominantly going to be a change in copy number, and so that's going to be what is uh, driving a, a cancer. But then for unbalanced or balanced events, for like reciprocal translocations, um, inversions, things like that, then the effect is not going to be in the copy number space. It's going to be at the boundary, uh, at the breakpoint, and that's going to be uh, more often something that looks like a fusion or an interruption of a gene. So there's several uh, databases for which we can look at uh, uh, information about gene fusions that have already been discovered, including uh, the TCGA gene fusion portal, which basically takes the landscape, the data from the landscape paper in the previous slide and uh, makes it searchable. Um, you can also uh, search for and look for uh, information about gene fusions at Cosmic. Um, there's another database called ChimerDB that builds on top of Cosmic and a database called ConjoinG, which is more for read-throughs or 
transcription induced chimeras. Okay, so now a little bit more about uh, trying to understand the impact of um, gene fusions on uh, the transcriptome and how we generally prioritize these events. One of the things that happens is if we look at uh, expression of the exons of genes that are involved in a gene fusion across, uh, across the gene, then often we'll find that uh, at the breakpoint there's a transition in expression because the wild type is not being expressed or is expre being expressed at a very low level, whereas the, the fusion transcript is being expressed at a high level. So this is, um, this is evidence that perhaps this, uh, these particular gene fusions are um, at least highly expressed. We don't know whether or not they're impacting the cancer. Um, we can have groups of gene fusions that are similar just in the three prime gene that is, is say upregulated uh, or uh, has it um, is, in, is involved for some reason with it. Uh, usually what happens is we have a promoter that is specific to a cancer that um, is upregulating the same uh, three prime gene. And so across multiple different cancers, the three prime gene is common and the mechanism for creating additional um, increased expression of that oncogene is just <coughs> translate location of a promoter in front of that gene. And then of course the, uh, the promoter that is sort of selected is dependent on the cancer because uh, different tissue types will have uh, different genes that are turned on in that particular cancer. And so it can be um, interesting to look at uh, in this figure, we're showing a set of uh, fusions that were known that involved BRAF and then in, I believe, so gastric tumors and prostate tumors. Um, the authors at the bottom here found additional BRAF fusions that hadn't been discovered yet. And they were able to say, well, since BRAF is involved in the, as a partner in these other um, cancers, then they're probably functional in the cancers we found them in. As I was uh, saying before, read-throughs are these types of events that you will find to be very prevalent if you're looking at results of gene fusion analysis tools, but they're less likely to be uh, functional. Um, in the, the figure on the left here, we're just showing uh, what is the most common combination of exons for uh, read-throughs, and it's showing for read-throughs for, for uh, intra-chromosomal events, which is in pale blue here, um, for read-through events. Most commonly, it's, uh, say, the N minus 1 exon of the upstream gene is joined to the, uh, the second exon of the downstream gene. So basically, we are uh, skipping those exons uh, the, the final exon of, of the five prime gene and the first exon of the three prime gene. Whereas uh, for interchromosomal events, this like dark blue bar here, then that can be sort of any combination of the exons. And then on the right uh, is uh, showing across different tissue types, interchromosomal uh, versus um, so we're, we're showing the prevalence on the, on the far right, we're showing the prevalence of particular uh, interchromosomal fusion events, and then at the bottom here, read-through events, and you can see that the prevalence across uh, samples is quite high for read-through events, and then across uh, all of these, across these samples for all of these read-through events, uh, they are present usually in just one or two samples, except for this uh, T. empiricis 2 erg. I mentioned this briefly, but um, to understand whether or not the function of the three prime gene is, is preserved after a fusion, we have to look at how the uh, resulting fusion transcript would be translated uh, correctly or incorrectly.
uh, in for, for the three prime exons. And there's a number of possibilities. Uh, we could have a fusion transcript for which the exons join together such that the codons are sort of perfectly aligned. Uh, and we go from uh, a codon in the three prime gene or five prime gene directly to a codon in the three prime gene that are fully formed. Uh, this is about one in nine chance by random, um, at random. Also possible is that we have uh, the exons are brought together such that uh, just the exon right at the fusion boundary is nonsense, but then we continue on with uh, the exons of the three prime gene as uh, being uh, properly formed. So everything is aligned except for this, this uh, middle codon. And then uh, at two out of three times, we have this possibility where uh, there, um, the exons are brought together in a way that we, uh, the, the, the three prime protein sequence is effectively nonsense. between, uh, so the, the one that I have my mouse over and the bottom one. Yeah. So the bottom one is the one that, for which we lose the function of the three prime gene. And then this uh, top right one is probably, um, there's no loss of function of the three prime domains. Uh, Cause I don't, I mean, generally one codon is not going to affect the function, especially you know, unless this is interrupting a particular domain. In this example, uh, yeah, no, it's just a nonsense codon. <laughs> Um, or I should make, I assume it makes sense. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I showed this, this figure in, at the top in um, the slide on uh, complex rearrangements, um, chromoplexy in the rearrangement section. Uh, I'll just highlight it here again because it, is sort of an example of how we can get additional information by looking in whole genome sequencing and looking at the, the rearrangements that are causative of the fusions. Uh, here we see that there's this complex event where four loci have been broken, permuted, and then rejoined, and then those uh, resulting four gene fusions, uh, of those four, two of them are actually involving genes uh, with known oncogenic function. And those two are, uh, in this sample, putatively, they're affecting the cancer of the, the biology of the cancer. Um, and I think this is this particular example is interesting because it shows sort of an example of a, a double hit where two, uh, one event is creating two um, gene fusions simultaneously. So we can definitely get additional information by looking in. Um, in the rearrangement space when we're analyzing fusions. Another example below here is uh, a gene fusion that we would not have picked up in the, if we were analyzing the rearrangements by, in isolation because uh, what we're showing is uh, the gene fusion at the top and uh, you'll see that the first and second exon, the intron in between the first and second exon that's where the breakpoint is, is residing, and the breakpoint is complex. So uh, it's not just a clean break of two genes brought together. In the middle of the breakpoint, there's two other one kilobase regions. And so if we were to analyze the whole genome data, we would see these three breakpoints in isolation. But we would never find the connection between uh, the two genes that we found using RNA-seq. This is just something to be aware of. All right, so to give a sort of forward-looking um, couple of slides, uh, recently we had uh, um, a drug called grisotinib that passed uh, phase three 
trials, or it's in phase three trials. This is targeting uh, the EML4 ALK uh, fusion in lung cancer that is, uh, is active in about 5% of lung cancers. And so this is, uh, I guess, where our gene fusion prediction um, from RNA-seq is coming to fruition and, and producing results in terms of um, targeted therapies. And then finally, uh, also interesting and sort of in a future development is how we're now using uh, uh, gene fusions in, a, in the context of oncoproteogenomics, try and go into mass spec data, try and identify which uh, fusions are producing peptides. Um, and the, the details of this are in the slide, but uh, I think the interesting uh, way in which this could help cancer patients is perhaps if we can identify fusions, even if they're coming from, ge from genome instability, if their clonal is in there present in all of the cancer cells and they're producing uh, novel peptides, then these can be perhaps the used in um, immunotherapy. So targeting those, those peptides in immunotherapy could potentially be a solution for some of these patients. Okay, and so now uh, that's the end of the, the lecture part, and I'll start the gene fusion discovery and characterization lab.